Okay, so let's start. Uh, so even before we go into uh, the next part of the lecture, uh, I wanted, actually I went through the um, tutorial that you guys submitted. I'm not talking about the second question, I'm talking about the first question now. So um, I wanted to ask your opinion about what this will be, right? So I got, I got the sense of what the class thinks, but I want to get a sense of uh, what the live audience thinks. So let's say I have a, I have a network within which I have some element ZL and uh, the ZL is part of a bigger network, right? I don't know what this network is. We can have uh, linear, non-linear, time variant, whatever be it, right? So inside this, we don't know what type of network this is. There is no constraint on this network, N. Okay. And let's say I am observing this network for all time. And after this observation, at certain time instance, I find that the voltage across this ZL is V, v of T. Okay. And the current through it is I of T. Okay. So what I'll do is what I'm hypothesizing is I will take the same network and I will observe the same set of nodes. That is, let's say this is node A and this is node B. So I'll bring out node A and node B and I'll replace this ZL, right? I'll replace this ZL with a voltage source, okay? Or well, let me replace it with a current source. I mean, that would be a more easier way to look about it. And I make the value of this current source exactly equal to I of T. Okay. So the question is, this is the same question that I asked in the tutorial. And let's say this is V F of T. So can I uh, draw a relationship between V of T and V of T F of T? How many of you think that I can draw a relationship between V of T and V F of T? Raise, raise your hands, please. And how many of you think that there is no relationship at all between V of T and V F of T? There are many undecided. So what do the undecided folks think? How many of you are undecided? I mean, I have covered all options, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let me ask any of you who think that uh, why v, v of T equal to V F of T? Any, any volunteers? Yes. Okay. So you are saying that. Okay. So you are essentially saying that if I look, if I remove this ZL, and I essentially look into these two ports, right? So I'm just erasing this. And I'm looking into these two ports and I'm trying to figure out what is the effective impedance, right? These two, since these two networks are identical, the effective impedance is same. And that's why I, if I have same I, I should have same V. Is, is that what you are proposing? Yes. Okay. So how many of you think his uh, proposition is correct? Okay. So now let me just twist this and say that when you say impedance, do you inherently mean that there is, it's a network is linear? Okay, so now my question in this was, this network need not be linear. It can be any network inside. Then in that case, my assumption will be wrong. So, it will be something like a frequency dependent or something capacitive or inductive can be there. Or it can be a second order something impedance going on. Okay, so there are multiple things that you said I wanted to address. So if it's a capacitor, does it uh, affect linearity? No. No, right? So when I say nonlinear, I mean there is no 
IV characteristics is not first order. Okay. It can have a diode, you can have a transistor. Yeah, I mean, you can have a, uh, I mean, a, a, a nonlinear switch. It can be anything, right? So in that case, can I, if I go back to this, Can I say anything between V of T and V of of T? As it turns out, you can. And this is what we call a substitution theorem. Have you heard of substitution theorem? So what does it say? I mean, substitution theorem says exactly the, I mean, whatever I have shown here, that if you have two networks, which are identical, you bring two nodes out, and you observe the voltage across, the voltage or current across, uh, current through any element, and you replace that element with some voltage or current source, which is exactly identical, or which is identical to the voltage drop or the current through the first network. Then the other variable that is a voltage, if you, are, if you are, the example that I have shown here, that I have replaced the I of T, replace the current that was going through Z of L with the current source I of T. In that case, the voltage in two networks will be identical. What does it essentially mean? It essentially means that regardless of whatever you have within this network, if you change, if you replace this Z of L with some element which, which gives you the impression, which gives the network that impression that nothing has changed, right? So what is this network thinking? This network is seeing from this terminal A, a current I of T is coming out and into the terminal B, a current I of T is going in. As long as you can satisfy these two conditions, the rest of the network need not worry, correct? So what I'm essentially saying is I'll take this network and I replace, I am observing this current that is coming out of A and I am putting a current source. Let's say this current source can go anywhere. I don't care. This is I of T. And I am observing this network B at this terminal B and I am putting in a current source, I of T. And this is the, my good old network. So as long as I am observing this, these two terminals, these two terminals are the entry points to this network. So if, the, if I can satisfy the entry points of the network, as far as current is concerned, then the voltage should also get satisfied because they are essentially dual properties. I mean, they are not independent of each other, right? And this can also be easily be proved. I mean, I will not go through the proof. I'll ask you to look it up, just Google, uh, proof of th substitution theorem. I, I think you should get you should get many, or if you have any network books, you can look it up. Okay. So the the assumption doesn't. I mean, the proof doesn't require linearity to hold. Okay. You had a question? Yeah. Sir, uh, if you consider a, uh, some uh, source or anything inside the network, right. which depends upon the network Z. Right. In, in that case, what is it? So we are removing the data replacing it by. Yeah, so when you say it depends on the value of Z, what, what, what does it mean? I mean, ultimately, no, I mean, you don't have any current con control source that depends on the Z. It depends on a voltage or it depends on the current. Any control source cannot be dependent upon the resistance. You have to sense the resistance. How do you sense the resistance? Through voltage or current. Right? So we are working under those principles that this is an electrical network and only sensing options are voltages and currents. Right. Doesn't matter, right? All I am saying is the network, these two networks are identical. Right? So this is I of T, right? At, across time, you have to satisfy. This whatever voltage or current source that you'll be replacing these two net the network on the right with the element on the left with and then the network on the right the current or the voltage should match across time, which essentially means that initial condition is taken care of, right? Yes. What about its 
the relation with the force conversion theorem where we trace a parallel resistor uh, with the correct force. I don't understand why. Why should that be a problem? Usually we have if we convert a source uh -huh. from voltage to a current source, right. and they are related right. with the resistor value. Right. In that case, also the relation holds, and here we are not having a resistor instead of. Uh, no, no, you can have resistor inside, right? In the within so n. The parallel value taken in parallel with the current psi of p. Okay, so okay, so then that this leads to another question. So let's assume uh, I have. I mean, are you okay with this idea? Are you okay with these two equivalents? So you have a problem with this. This one is it? No, you can speak aloud because this will be used somewhere down the line. This also looks okay, but. Uh... Uh, it should have some relation with that theorem also, no? Source conversion. No, no, source cons conversion theorem is what? I mean, you you have a, I mean, you can essentially Nortonize or Thevenize anything. That's all it says, right? But you will see that Norton and Thevenin's equivalent, I mean, the proof of Thevenin's or Norton's theorem comes from substitution. And in that proof, you will see that there is a linearity requirement that will creep in. And that is a subset of substitution, essentially, right? So. I mean, if substitution holds, they hold, not the other way around. Okay. Okay, fine. So I'll not delve into this too much. I'll post a network assignment tonight. We'll have a I mean, deadline somewhere next week, like right? sometime next week. Okay. So, so in the last lecture, we were I mean, a quick recap of the last lecture. Uh, we were essentially looking into an op, uh, looking into ways of making a voltage source. I said we are essentially looking uh, into op options of making a voltage source, and then we we should we said that if these, I mean, initially if we assume that we are trying to get VDD by two, or rather, if we, with the two, example that I took was VDD equal to three volt. And let's say this R and these R are equal, which means this will be 1.5 volt. But now if I want to drive a resistance RL, the problem becomes when I connect these two, this RL loads, this RL loads my resistor divider and this 1.5 volt will go, will go down, right? So then we said that one way to or make sure that this RL doesn't load is to is to make these resistors, these R, these R resistors to be much smaller than RL, right? So that the voltage across here, I mean, in other words, this RL is much, much greater than the internal resistance of, of, the, of the source. So in that case, obviously it will not load and I'll be fine. But the issue was, you know, if you have to do this, then the amount of quiescent power that will be quiescent current that will be drawing just for biasing purposes will be prohibitively large. You won't be able to do anything substantial, right? So just to just to generate that voltage, regardless of whether you are having a load connected to it or not, you will have you will be burning a lot of current. So this is not something that is feasible. By the way, I mean in this case, uh, what is what is the uh, I mean, if we still want to go ahead with this R to be much smaller than RL, I mean that that kind of scenario, what is the constraint? RL should be much greater than what? Is it? It should be greater than what? The resistance looking in, right? Yeah, it should be lesser than the Thevenin equivalent resistance should be less than R by two, right? Sorry, RL should be much greater than R by two. Okay. Fine. So, I mean, the reason I'm going through this is that in the next part of the course, I want these to be second nature, right? You, you, you I mean, regardless, now I have only R and R, I might be having control sources, right? So, at the, I mean, I want you to practice so much that you don't have to think about what is the, I mean, do I have to do seven ins? I mean, you should see and figure out that, yes, I need to do seven ins. Okay. Okay. So the next thing that I, uh, the next thing uh, 
that we, I mean, not in this particular order, but then the other thing that we developed upon was another way of dealing this with this problem is saying that if I know this resistance RL is variable, I mean, obviously this resistance RL will be variable because you don't always have fixed activity in your device. And if I connect these two, one way to fix this problem without burning a lot of current is the fact that I will, I'll have a way of sensing what is the effective output, instantaneous output impedance and make my, this register divider ladder have identical output impedance so that the division ratio remains the same. Okay. So, which essentially means that if I, I mean, in the simplistic example, if I just put another register here and make this also equal to RL, and since RL is very varying with time, both of these will be RL of T. Then I see that my division ratio is satisfied across time. But the issue is that I don't have a priori information of RL, RL of T, which means there should be some way of feeding this information back to control whatever RL of T I want to want to uh, satisfy. Okay. Now, which means that we need to learn about feedback. There is another way of dealing with this problem, which is also similar to this, but again, substitution theorem will come handy. is the fact that if I know this, when I put this RL, right, when I put this RL here, I know that it will draw some current and this current will be varying with time because RL is varying with time. So if I can, again, if I can sense this current and for all practical purposes, going back to substitution theorem, if I know what this I of T is, I can replace this RL for the purpose of analysis with the same current source of value i of t right so these two conditions or rather let me redraw Okay, so, so essentially these two conditions will be identical as far as the observation of this voltage V naught of T will be concerned, right? Because these two I naught, these I naught T and this I naught T are identical, right? Substitution theorem. So now what I am proposing is that instead of putting a voltage variable resistor on the top of a part, what I can simply do is to have a variable current source I of T, right? So now you see that whatever this extra requirement of I of T that the load is having can be satisfied by the current source that I have put on top. But again, I, this current source is not independent because I don't have information of the output load a priori, which means this will be some sort of dependent current source. Okay. And when you have dependence current source, there will be some dependent, some terminal which on which it will depend on. That's what we'll see as the course progresses, right? How to make this dependence. Okay. Any questions till now? No? Okay. So let's proceed. So the other thing that also we talked uh, that we talked about was the fact that we need not necessarily limit our applications to constant voltages, right? So the examples that I gave you where I mean I'm trying to make a battery, typically batteries are 
uh, are constant voltage sources, but the application need not be limited to constant voltages. By that, what I mean is you might have a AC source, Vs, and naturally all sources will have some resistances associated with it. And you might have a load RL. You need to replicate this voltage Vs across the load RL, right? So this is Vs of T. I want to make this also Vs of T, okay? which essentially means that I'll have to put something in between for this to take place, okay? So now let's, I mean, have you heard of this maximum power transfer theorem? Okay, so what does it say? Impedance matching, if impedance matches, what happens? And what is the maximum power? Okay, so if I simply connect these two, if I simply connect these two, obviously, I will not be able to, under the condition of maximum power transfer, I will not be able to match this, get this voltage Vs across the resistance RS, resistance RL, because RS has to be equal to RL. Okay. But now if I want to get this Vs across RL, then I land up with a constraint that, what is the constraint? RL has to be much greater than RS, right? So which again means that I am constraining my RL, right? So, but in applications, you don't know what RL might be. You might know a range of RL, but you don't know what exactly RL will be. Again, this RS can be, a, can be quite high, quite low, depending upon what type of source this is. But under all conditions, I want Vs to be supplied to RL. Okay, so naturally, direct connection won't suffice. Okay, so now I would like to understand what type of block I need to put in inside in order to get this uh, Vs directly transferred to RL. That is one goal. The other goal is also, the uh, extension of that goal is that I need not limit myself to the case where Vs only needs to get transferred. I might need a case where I need some factor of Vs to be transferred. And this factor alpha need not necessarily be less than one. Okay. Which essentially means that I need some sort of amplification. Okay. So, if I need some sort of amplification, uh, let's assume alpha equal to one to make our life easy for the time being. If alpha equal to one, what is the typical power transferred uh, to RL? Average power transfer to RL? Vs squared by RL, right? And what is the maximum power that I can draw out of uh, out of the source. That is under the condition of matching. But forget under the, I'm not saying that I need to deliver that power to the load. What I'm saying is that, what is the maximum power that VS can deliver? Okay, let me rephrase the question. Let's go along with this maximum power transfer theorem. So if, if we, even if we, Go along with the maximum power transfer theorem. The maximum power delivering capacity of this is Vs squared by 4 RL, 4 RS, right? So under obviously under the condition that RS is different from RL, these two will not match. Okay. So if these doesn't, these don't match, and it's quite possible that Vs squared by RL is much higher than Vs squared by 4 RS. Okay, which means what? I need some power gain. Okay. So now the question that, that I pose to you is the fact that this block, what is the characteristics of this block that is required to achieve this power gain? Right. 
Perfect. So I have some network in. Okay. So uh, what I what we readily said that p out can need not necessarily be less than p in. So let's take the extreme case where p out should be greater than p in, right? So if p out should be greater than p in, can you comment on anything about the network then? Okay, we need an amplifier. Okay, so the question is, how do I make an amplifier? I mean, can I do something just, I mean, assume that you, you don't, okay. The other thing is that this network can has, it can have, can it be linear? Why not? Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll get to what region and all later on. We haven't even touched on this. Test. So region doesn't. If it, is an amplifier, it has to be linear. if it is an amplifier, it has to, but how do you make an amplifier? That's the question, right? Yeah, so we'll introduce active elements later on, but why do I need an active element in the first place? Can I make, the question essentially is that if it's a linear circuit, if it's a, so I give you an amplifier, I give you an active element, right? right? So let's say, I mean, a diode is an active element. I mean, diode is a nonlinear element, right? And I give you a transistor and I just connect it like this. Can I get P out less greater than P in? And that means what? What else is needed? You need another source. Why do you need another source? Biasing and all are very secondary things. There is much more fundamental things at play. Why do you need another source? Exactly, right? Exactly. You want the out, exactly. So you need output power to be greater than the input power. And that simply you cannot have when you have only one source at the uh, in play. From there, you can only have ex extract so much of power. And if you need higher power, obviously this arrangement is not su sufficient. You need another source. Okay, so which means that first, first requirement is another source, fine. So let's put in another source. Let me now mark the terminals because now we have multiple. So this is one, one dash, two, two dash, and three, and let it be a common terminal at the input side, okay. So now let's assume that I have, I don't have nonlinear elements. I have only linear elements inside, but I have a source. Can I get P out to be greater than P in? No. Why not? No. Ah, exactly, right? So essentially what is happening is that you will get, I mean, now let's do, some maths. So let's say this is I1, this is I2, and you are pushing in let's say I3. Okay, so what is the total power at the output? I2 square RL average. What is the total power delivered to the network? Pardon? Really? Why? Can you make a judgment from whatever I have uh, sketched? What is the, okay, let's do the easier thing first. What is the power delivered by the uh, DC source? I mean, simple is a B into I, right? Why do you need to go to square? B D C times I three plus some power delivered by source, right? How much is that? Ah, right. So how do you, I mean? This I'm curious. Why do you say V is squared by R S? What I mean? What makes you say that? When I say power delivered into the network, what am I saying? I'm saying what is the power delivered into this? Right? 
So in order to understand what is the power delivered into this, what information do you need? Yeah, even before that, I need the, the voltage information between one one dash terminal, right? So I need this, this information V1, let's say. Without that V1, I don't have an information, right? In order to get a V1, you probably need an internal, I mean, what is the input resistance and all. But at its very core, you need V1, okay? So, but you, you already have I1, so this is V1 times I1 average. And this P in total can obviously be greater than P out. I mean, I can design my VDC in such a way that obviously this can be greater than, but I mean, as some one of you pointed out, there is an issue with this. And what is the issue? The issue is essentially the fact that, I mean, let's assume that this VS is a sinusoidal source. By the way, why do you always go get into the sinusoidal source business? There are so many time varying sources available. What is so holy about sinusoidal? Okay, but easy to handle at the output, you can just see the change in field and magnitude. Yeah, handling you can have safe function also, right? Easy to handle. Yeah, I mean, as, as you said, this eigen function, but what is, I mean, essentially what. Uh, it means in plain English is the fact that you can decompose any signal as sum of sinusoids, right? So, right. So, if I know how my circuit responds to one sinusoid, I can essentially scale it to whatever I want, right? Okay. I mean, by the way, I mean you can decompose your circuit not only with sinusoids across. I mean, you can also say it's a, I mean, cascades of uh, scaled delta functions also. But I mean, so we do certain type of analysis in sinusoidal domains, certain types in, uh, in the, I mean, assuming impulse responses. But well, I mean, since Fourier transform and Fourier series are real, I mean, sinusoids directly give us a, uh, a way of looking into the frequency component of the frequency analysis of your circuit also. So sinusoids are often the go-to signals of choice while analyzing these things. Okay. So if you if you have let's say uh, input with sinusoid uh, with the frequency omega naught, obviously I mean you would want the output to be an amplified version or the same same version of omega naught, right? Uh, some scaled version of omega naught, some same scale scale version of the signal operating at omega naught, but what you see here is this V1 times I1 can have as the signal of frequency omega naught, but can you comment on this term VDC times I3? It will be at same frequency as? Why do you say so? That's a very interesting answer. So. Uh, how many of you think that this this component, right? This component that is the sig, I mean, the power that I will get from this term will correspond to the power of a sinusoid. Can you raise your hands? So none of you think that. So what does this power correspond to? DC power. Okay, so now, I mean, do you, if I, if I tell you that I3 has a sinusoidal component, right? It can have, I have some sinusoidal activity going on in the network, which means that I3 can, this, if I plot I3, it can have some sinusoidal response, correct? So now can you comment on this term? How can a DC source generate AC signal? But can a DC can a DC source sink in an AC signal? It can, right? So I can have a DC source. I can hook up a current source which is sinusoidal. It can have, right? Sir, in this in this term, the power is a certain time. The power is oscillating, but uh, the VDC is always constant. The I three is changing its size. Right. That is varying power. So note, I'm what note this term. Note note this 
dash on top. What does it mean? So now, can you comment? What will be the average of this VDC times I three? Right, zero. Because I three is essentially a zero mean signal, and VDC is constant. Right. I three can have a DC DC component also. I mean, in fact, it normally has, which means that the sinusoid is pro this I three sinusoid is probably not varying around zero. It's varying around some some other fact, some I mean other mean value. But the moot point here is that this term will be the 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 sinusoidal component, the power due to the sinusoidal component. Will be zero, but you will get something because of some DC power consumption. Okay, so which essentially means that the purpose of adding this VDC is not really served because it's not delivering power to your desired frequency, right? Which means that we have to do something else, and as one of you pointed out, we need frequency translation, right? We need some way. Of translating this this uh, power that is getting delivered at DC to to omega naught, right? And only way you can I mean one of the ways you can do frequency translation is not by using LTI system. You have to use either time variant or nonlinear system. We'll not deal with time variance here. We'll deal with nonlinearity in this course. Okay. In, any any questions? So, uh, why is it an average value important? Because uh, there should be other uh, RMS values and all that. Why they are not Okay, so when do you say? I mean, RMS. What are you essentially saying? That will not be zero. Will why not do you say RMS will not be zero? What, when you say power, what do you essentially mean? Ultimately, at its root cause, what is power? P is V into I. This is the fundamental definition, right? I mean, I'm not going into complex numbers and I mean, complex power, but this is instantaneous power is this. When you say average power, you do average of, on top of this. But now when you say RMS, what are you essentially saying? I'm converting I into V, that is V by R, then taking the average. Average of V squared is essentially the variance that is RMS, right? So that is a subset, okay? So the RMS taken from this, taken from this, yeah, I mean, you have a, if you have a DC power, I mean, if you have a, if I3 has a DC component, then it's not zero. If I3 has a zero DC component, then it is zero, right? But if I3 is a sensor component. Okay, so let's, let's, let's break it down further. So this is one volt battery and this is I naught. This I naught is this. It's a one amp sinusoid. What is the power drawn from my, my from the battery? The average power drawn is zero, but is the instantaneous power drawn zero? Mm -hmm. No, right? So because instantaneous power, what will it be? It will go, I mean, obviously it's I times V. So instantaneous power will also follow this. I mean, depending on this, since this is one volt, so it will simply be this. So at one cycle, at one half cycle, you are seeing that power is getting drawn. In other half cycle, you are seeing the power is getting fed back, right? So on an average, the total power is zero. Okay, and that's how, in fact, I mean, you can argue why your capacitors or inductors don't take any power. Because you do the same thing with the capacitor or inductor, you will see that in one half cycle, you are drawing power, in other half cycle, you are sourcing power, right? If you consider a resistance along with this, I don't. Then obviously you are not satisfying this condition, right? And then you would- the RMS power will be non-zero. Yeah, so you are putting, then you are putting that, uh, Okay, so if you are putting a series resistance, right? Yeah. Ah, okay, interesting question, right? So then what? In that case, the, the power. Power drawn from the source. Uh, one volt source is not zero. Why? 
Because sir, the sensor current, I know, should dissipate some power across. Yeah, but again, go into and look into the putting a series. I mean, when you are putting something in series with the uh, ideal current source, does it affect anything? Mm -hmm. so, sir, current will be the same. The right. So I times the average is still the same. G is not changing. I is not changing. Why should it change? Right. So your question is, I mean, register dissipative element, drawing current, why this is happening, right? Yeah. Essentially, yeah, that's the question. Just thinking like that, we have an amplifier and some DC sources. We'll get to amplifier, man. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we'll have enough questions on amplifiers. Don't worry. Let's build up to it. So could you explain that part again, sir? When you said we need frequency translation from the so okay. second time part. Okay. Like, yeah. What's the question? V1 I1 now can that help in getting V1 I1 obviously will be at omega naught, right? This will be power delivered at omega naught. No, don't I mean no question about that. Okay, but what are you what, what I'm essentially saying is that this term is essentially, I mean, if you use how do you get how do you get this uh, if everything is linear, I can I basically skipped one step. So if everything is linear, I can use superposition, right? So if I use superposition, what I can say is that I can short VDC and then, then do my analysis. And then I can short VS and then do the analysis and then add up all the currents and I'll get what I want, right? So, but since the current I2 that I am getting only has omega naught component, right? So from that analysis, essentially what we can gather is that regardless of whether I put VDC or not, this, this I, the power delivered into this RL is emitted at omega naught is immaterial of whether I am putting VDC or not, right? VDC is not affecting my power delivered at omega naught. So I put VDC, I don't put VDC, it doesn't really matter. It means the, it means the network has only Right. So if we had a transistor, by then then it could have impacted. Yeah, then it could have. That is a nonlinear element. Right. So if you have a non, that's what I mean. You need nonlinearity. Nonlinearity is essential. That's the take-home message. Okay. So what is the frequency translation basically? Okay. So you have you the you have two sources, right? You have Vs at omega naught and you have Vdc at frequency of zero, right? And we established that Vs simply because you cannot generate more power than what you are putting in. You can, you will not be able to get more power at the output than you can extract from Vs, right? So you need some other source. So one option is one might say I put another Vs somewhere in some other port. So I'll add up all the VS powers and eventually I'll get something, but that's not what we are looking for. So generally what we do, we put a battery, but the battery is at a frequency of zero. But how will that frequency of zero battery help me in getting, a, getting power at frequency omega naught? Right? So essentially I'm trying to get generate a signal which will give me power at omega naught, right? Which means I need some, some sort of, some way of converting that zero frequency signal into omega naught. So right now we are getting P out still less than P. Yes. Exactly, at omega naught. The total power, if you add up like all frequency powers, you can get infinitely high, depending on how, how high VDC can be. But we are only interested at power at omega naught, right? Okay. Okay, fine. So this is an interesting question. I would, I mean, I would invite all of you to ponder why still the, I mean, what is the role of RS here? I, mean, I have RS, dissipative element, still power is zero. What's happening, right? Think about it. Yeah, yeah, so it's basically boils down to that. There are only three elements, what else will happen? So think about it. Critically, if you have a problem, beat me later, right? Okay, yeah.
Yeah. That's what. Think about it. <laughs> okay. So, uh, so, uh, so let's move ahead. I think. I mean, I'm running behind schedule. So, we, as long as we agree that we need nonlinear elements. So, what we ne next we need to do is figure out how to analyze these nonlinear elements because as we know that nonlinear elements do not really have a generic solution, right? So there are specific type of techniques that we use to make our lives easy because if I just give you an nth order polynomial, it doesn't have any generic solution, right? So let's assume that I have a nonlinear element. This is nonlinear, nonlinear network rather. And I characterize this nonlinearity, let's say, with a generic function. That is, if this current is I1, this current is I2, and let's say this is V1, this is V2. So let's say I2 is some function f of V1, V2, and Vdc. Similarly, I1 is also some function of f, V1, so f1. Let's just say two. Let me do the other way around, right? So let's say I one is equal to this. I two equal to. Okay, and I'm not writing the current through VDC because that is kind of immaterial. In fact, we can also uh, we can also drop this term VDC from this nonlinearity uh, from this uh, function because we essentially will be treating VDC as a parameter. We are not, we typically don't change the voltage source values. The voltage source remain as is, which means that if that is a constant, we can treat it as a parameter and, and get rid of it. So going forward, I'll not treat VDC within this function. Now, the important thing here to note is, is that what I, the example that we were taking, the power delivered at omega naught and all, is, a, is obviously not the DC power, right? We are talking about power being delivered to a load, which is driving or which is uh, accepting a time varying signal, which means a incremental signal, right? So we will limit our analysis to incremental changes. How large an incremental change is acceptable, we'll see later on. But the moot point here is that we we'll limit our changes, we'll limit this analysis to incremental changes because, firstly, again, generic nonlinear functions are uh, you cannot solve, but we need not do that because we are essentially looking for time varying signals, which means they are changing with time, which means, in other, in other words, uh, which means that we are looking at incremental signals, which means that I am looking at a case where. When I apply this, uh, when I apply this source Vs, this V1 will change from let's say V1Q to so V1 changes V1Q to V1Q plus delta V1. V2 changes from V2Q to V2Q plus delta V2. Similarly, I1 changes from I1Q and I2 changes from I2Q. All we are interested in is the relationship between these deltas. We are not particularly interested in 
what is the relationship between v1 q v2 q v1 q v2 q we are interested in the relationship between the deltas because deltas are are the information okay and generally how we do this we say that i can expand any nonlinear function in a taylor series form around some operating point or around some in this case around some uh, uh, pivot in which in this case is v1 q v2 q i1 q i2 q which essentially means that i have i1 q plus delta i1 will be f1 of v1 q plus delta v1 to q plus delta v2 and similarly i2 q plus delta i2 will be f2 of q and i hope everybody is familiar with taylor series anybody who is not familiar with taylor series good so so i'll expand this one i'll expand this around v1 q v2 q so this becomes what will be the first term right then delta v1 f1 dash plus delta v2 one then louder please when if double dash delta v2 squared by 2 If double dash, then you will have a cross term. Delta v one, delta v two, f double dash, and so on, and you will have cubic term and so on and so forth, right? So, but can I? What is the relate? I mean, what is the relationship between i one q and this f one v one q v two q? They are identical because we started off with this assumption. We started off with this. assumption that my uh, nonlinear element is of this model so i simply replace v1 q v2 q then the initial condition was i1 q is equal to v1 f f1 of v1 q v2 q which means these two terms go off and i am left with delta i1 and so on similarly if i do the same analysis for delta i2 i should get i'll just write the final expression this will become delta v1 f2 dash plus delta v2 f2 dash okay so now when we said that we are interested in sinusoidal wave forms what we essentially meant is that your delta v1 is operating at omega not like your delta v1 can be delta v1 let's say is delta v1 is essentially the voltage that we observed at the input port of the network it's not vs by the way so delta v1 is some signal which is operating at omega not delta v2 is also some signal which is operating at omega not but what is delta v1 squared operating at twice omega not right and if you have delta v1 q we will have 3 omega not and so on so obviously out of these we desire 
only things at omega naught and we don't desire things at any other harmonics because we want fidelity of the signal right we want whatever we are putting in we want some scale version of that we don't want other frequencies to interfere so which essentially means that i would like to keep all these delta v square delta v cube terms to be much uh, much smaller than this delta v1 term now going before going forward let's take an example so let's assume that a much simpler example let's say delta i i some network or i have delta i equal to uh, g1 times delta v plus g2 times delta v squared okay nonlinear network single port uh, one input variable is delta v output variable is delta i so this is what we, we that we that is what we have characterized right so once we have characterized this even before going forward what is the unit of g1 conductance right amp per volt or milli siemens right what is the unit of g2 pardon yeah or ampere per volt square right okay fine so let's take a number so delta i let's say is 1 milli siemens times delta v plus 100 milli 100 milliamp per volt square times delta v squared okay so i want a situation i want to understand uh first question is that i want to uh, understand if i can use this whatever network this equation characterizes can i use this network as a linear network under certain approximations delta v should be much smaller than what which means does which means there is a value of delta v associated right as long as i and what is that value let's assume that as you said delta v should be much this second term should be much smaller than the first term which means that delta v 100 times delta v squared has to be less than one times delta v which means delta v delta v has to be less than 100 right so this is what what is the unit one by hundred volt, which means this is ten millivolt, right? Okay. So now let's assume that I want to make this uh, network more linear. What do I need to do? Mathematically, let's assume. Mathematically, you are talking about what do I need to do? No, network is independent of delta v. Delta V should be smaller, but yeah. So, exactly from the designer's perspective, delta V is a is a user perspective, right? You are constraining the user to say that you are constraining the user that your delta V should be less than ten millivolt, otherwise you will get harmonics, right? But from a, a designer's perspective, your job is to make sure that this G two is reduced, right? So if you reduce G two, you will get better and better performance, right? So goal of a circuit designer is you have to use nonlinear elements that we all already figured out but if you use nonlinear elements you will get also undesired harmonics so the goal of a circuit designer is to use nonlinear elements but not to affect let these harmonics dominate your uh, dominate your output signal okay okay so we'll see again we'll see i mean all we are doing is laying the groundwork of where we are going we'll see how to do that Okay, so so now assuming that we are we are able to do that, right? Assuming that we have been able to suppress the higher order terms, then we can ease our analysis and say that if we are if we uh, if we can do that, we can neglect these higher order terms for our analysis, and we use only the uh, easier to handle terms, right? So we we'll, we use the uh, linear terms and get our life going. Okay, so. What we, so this is a recurring theme in design, right? You will see that in, in design, what we generally do is we say that we start off with, with a target, 
and we say that if the target is met assume the target is met if the target is met what is the condition under which the target is met and then i will do all my analysis under that condition i will not do the analysis under a generic condition so that's why i mean this is this is a generic design principle across fields electrical computer science mechanical doesn't matter you have to break down the bigger problem into smaller problems and then know the smaller problem very well so that you can build it up okay so so this is one generic principle i would want that you all of you take home across whichever course you are taking so so if we now assume that things are all good and we don't have we don't have to deal with higher order terms then delta i1 becomes f1 dash around v1 q v2 q times delta v1 Okay, and I'm sure you have seen these variants. And uh, generally, what we say is that all these deltas, we so this was I made up a mess of the symbols. This was caps. So generally, we say this delta i one is a small signal i one, and this first term of f one dash delta v one, as you also said, that the unit of this is Siemens or conductance. So we we will just say that this is. Y one one V one plus Y one two V two. Okay, so this is the standard Y parameter uh, two port equations that I'm sure all of you have seen in your network theory courses. Now, uh, the job again of a circuit designer is to interpret equations. One of the jobs is to interpret equations in the form of a circuit. Uh, so, how do I? The question is, how do I arrange these equations so that it makes sense in terms of a in in terms of the circuit elements that we are familiar with, right? So, if I if I just look into this first equation, what is it essentially saying? So. All these equations are derived with the standard network in mind, right? We had this standard network. This was V1. This is V2. Like incremental delta V, we have replaced with small V1 and V2. And this is this current I1. And I, this is this current I2. Now, I mean, initially we started off saying that current I2 was going out, but it doesn't really matter. Um, I mean, you can as well reverse the uh, reverse the uh, direction of the current. And one might also, if you are not even confident, I will just simply say that this I2 is minus of that. Right? So, uh, but the reason I am I have drawn it in this way is simply because I would. I mean, this is the standard literature convention. Okay. Okay, so now uh, if I look into this first equation, right, this first equation here, what is what is it essentially telling us? It's essentially telling us that the relationship between I one and V one is some constant times V one plus some constant times V two. So if I only concentrate on the first constant, that is this term, this is essentially telling that I have. Let me. Expand it a bit. This is essentially telling us is that I have some uh, I have some element here which is drawing current proportional to the voltage across this terminal. Right? And what is that element in this case? Y11. Y11. Right? And if we again, I mean, 
for the again for the purpose of simplicity we assume that all of these are real positive numbers right no i mean it's not necessary that it have to be because nonlinearity can be anything and from there its first derivative can be anything right but again to make life easy let's assume all of them are real positive numbers so which means that i have some element which is real and positive between these two terminals which means this is this is what i'm drawing i have an element here right the current being drawn here is i1 times v1 where i1 is a the y11 is y11 times v1 where y11 is a real positive number then what type of element is y11 conductance right it's a it's a resistance or i mean what's the conductance or a, in y11 is a conductance right so this is y11 so this is easy uh what is the second term and this is a this is a relationship between two different ports something is affecting i am drawing current from the first port observing the voltage at the proportional to the voltage of the second port right current being drawn which is proportional to some voltage at some other port is essentially a voltage controlled current source right so so by the way what is the direction okay it's downward because i am drawing current out of out of this port right this is y12 v2 similarly if i move on to the other terminal port 2 i will have i will have y22 and i will have y21 E one, okay. So now, uh, it's what we have essentially done is that we have reduced our problem, a generic nonlinear network, into a into a seemingly linear linearized model of that nonlinear network, and with the hope that I will get a power amplification. I mean, that's what at least the I mean uh, the fundamental analysis initially told us, right? so which essentially means that first we have to now go through the brute force method of figuring out what is v not over vs and whether in the, indeed we are getting power amplification okay so uh, easier way to i mean whenever you have something of this form and you are dealing with conductances and all so it's better to notonize the circuit so what why that what i mean is convert this vs into current source and its resistance in parallel so so this is rs i will just make it gs because everything is in conductance this value will be this value will be vs by rs vs into gs vs by rs same thing so do this analysis and tell me what is v not over vs Yeah, help me. Okay. Yeah. That's actually correct. So. Uh, 
if you have uh, not gotten it i would say I mean, do it again but i mean the way i i prefer to doing prefer to do it is basically if you write these two kcls here right so and you do matrix inver inversion right so if you remember kramer's rule it's basically one line uh, one line job okay <clears throat> so this in uh, this indeed is correct so i think we have one minute but even before going into we'll, we'll do, deal with this in the next class that will be on saturday but uh, before we leave uh, a quick comment on what we actually want we want this v0 by vs to be high low what order i mean what is the desired desired value i mean or rather desired uh, what do we desire out of this ratio we want it to be high right because ultimately we would, would want to at least get a i mean v not to be equal to vs or if not more which means i want to maximize this this entire term now this term can be tricky to analyze in general simply because one way to maximize this term that is to get it to infinity is to make sure the denominator goes to zero right and there is some positive minus some positive so i can one might say that i can get I can tune my y12 to one y21 in such a way that this entire thing goes to infinity and goes to zero. So I'll get infinite gain. But there is an issue with that. And the issue is when you have infinite gain, and let's say assume that we are not talking about infinite gain at DC, infinite gain at certain frequency, non-DC frequency, which means what? I mean, what do you understand by infinite gain at certain frequency? Do you understand anything? When I say something has infinite gain at some frequency, exactly right. Yeah. So without any input, you will you will get an output, right? I mean, zero input, some finite output. You can it's likely to get, and this is happening at some frequency, some non-zero frequency, which means you have a block whose input is shorted, but at the output, if you if you observe, you are getting some some frequency waveform. Which means, what is this? Oscillator. It's an oscillator. Uh, now, obviously, this is not something we desire, so we would like to steer clear of it. So, this is not a good thing to have. When you are trying to make an amplifier, you don't want this denominator to go to zero by simply canceling these two terms. However, if you want to make an oscillator, this is exactly what you want, right? So, if you remember, I mean, I don't know, you probably must have heard of Barkhusen criteria, right? Yeah. So, that essentially is. Uh, making this denominator zero in some other form. I mean, another way of saying the same thing. Okay, so uh, we'll stop here. We'll analyze this equation uh, more in detail in the next class. The next class will be on Saturday, 11 o'clock, same room.